All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm Christina Cologne, your co-chair for the Northern Turnpike Corridor and the Director of Transportation Development for Florida's Turnpike Enterprise. Thank you all for joining us today. I appreciate your taking time out of your schedule for this webinar. As you can hear, uh, Tom Byron is not leading our webinar today. Um, the good news is he is healthy and well and decided to retire from public service after 25 years with FDOT and serving our nation for 30 years in reserves and active duty in the armed services. Tom asked me to send his best to all of you and promised that he would be monitoring the progress of this task force. In addition, Shannon Wright, who represented the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, retired from her organization at the end of March. The commission has asked Chris Wynn to serve on the Northern Turnpike Corridor Task Force. Chris has been serving on the Suncoast Corridor Task Force and will now represent the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission on both task forces. Shannon promised that once we are all able to gather together in person, you will see her in the audience as an interested citizen as she is personally invested in this process. Please join me in thanking both Tom and Shannon for their public service. So it's been several weeks since we last met in person in Fanning Springs. We've been through and continue to go through a very challenging period with COVID-19. I want to emphasize our continued concern for the health and safety of our state and personally for you, your families, your friends and colleagues, and your communities. We have received many questions about when our next in-person meeting will take place. As you may be aware, the governor and legislature have extended the deadline for the task force report until November 15th. We are confident that we will be able to complete this work by that deadline. At this point, we are abiding by the governor's executive order and taking an abundance of caution. Once further guidance is received, we anticipate scheduling our next meeting within the following month. Hopefully, you have had a chance to complete the online modules that replaced task force meeting number five. If not, please access these modules as soon as possible. Our intent is for meetings six through nine all to occur in person before November. We will be in touch with you on this. We also intend to resume community open houses and other public input activities based on new guidance when received. In the meantime, we will continue to provide multiple opportunities for the public to receive information and provide input into the process. We are using virtual meeting abilities to continue task force member and public engagement through virtual options like this webinar. Before we get started, I want to ask for your patience and understanding today as we adjust to this temporary meeting model due to COVID-19. This is our first meeting via GoToWebinar. Please be understanding of any technical issues that might come up and allow us to address them so any future webinars might be more effective. We have also continued the technical work needed to gather, display, and analyze much of the data you have requested. In fact, I hope you will be pleased to see some of the additional data and graphics we are sharing today and providing in an online GIS tool for your review. Our purpose in conducting this webinar today is first to catch you up on the technical work that has been occurring since we last met and specifically, we want to focus on your input on two concepts, avoidance areas and attraction areas. Avoidance areas covered here will include those committed by FDOT and those requested by the task force in meeting number four. The attraction areas are the places where a connection to or service by a new corridor or existing enhanced corridor is desired to accomplish economic, community, environmental, or other goals such as areas targeted in local plans for economic development. 
Together, they provide a holistic view of the study area. This data and your input will be a critical foundation for our work moving forward. When we reconvene at meeting number six, we will use this information to refine and complete the needs and guiding principles. So before I turn the webinar over to our facilitator, Christine, I want to take a moment to thank our staff for their work to make this webinar possible and to get information out to you. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, everyone. It's great that we are able to meet again, even though it has to be virtually, not yet in person. I'm going to talk about the public comment period, logistics for this webinar, meeting objectives, the agenda, and provide a brief Florida Sunshine reminder. So the public comment period will begin at 10.30 this morning, or as soon as the agenda items are completed. Request to comment that were received by five o'clock yesterday evening, and we'll be addressing during the public comment period in the order in which they were received. For those of you in the public, when your name is called, we will unmute your line in order for you to provide comment within your allotted time of three minutes. Only one person at a time will be unmuted. If you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. If you did not submit your request in time to be able to speak today, please email your comments to fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. The webinar is being recorded and will be available with other materials on our MCORS website. You will remain muted for the entirety of the presentation. We will unmute task force members one at a time during the question and answer period. Again, only one person at a time will be unmuted. If, you self -mute, if you've self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. For the question and answer period, we will unmute all task force members one at a time for a single round. Do not, please do not put the webinar on hold or take another call as we will hear your hold music. One last note, we may have adjusted your username in order to readily identify you as a task force member in order to unmute your line. Please do not make any changes to the username so that you will be heard during the roll call and Q&A period. Okay, so the meat of the, the matter today. The objectives for today, we want to receive an update on the task force activities. Christine has just provided some of these in our opening, and you'll hear more throughout the presentation. Receive briefing on process for identifying our avoidance and attraction areas as input to the task force recommendations. We'll describe the homework process to receive task force member input at our next in-person meeting. And then as always, we'll receive public comment. So here's today's agenda. The public comment period is scheduled to begin at 10.30 this morning, or as soon as the agenda items are complete. We have received 134 responses to speak, which will take about six and a half hours. Um, and we hope that all the task force members will be able to stay online for that. Today, we have a short reminder of the government and the sunshine requirements in light of our new environment in which we're working. So generally speaking, task force members should not communicate either verbally, through email, or via a third party to any other task force member on items under consideration by the task force. You may, of course, communicate on matters unrelated to the task force topics. We have Diane with us today, D Diane Guimet from the Office of the Attorney General. Um, she's on the webinar as well, um, and we can call on her. She's already said good morning to the team. We can ask her any questions regarding the Sunshine Law as it relates to this task force when we get to the Q&A part of the agenda. Good morning, Diane, and thanks for joining us. All right, so here's a little bit of a challenge. We're going to do a roll call. I've, I've been trying to uh, keep tallies of those who have joined us on the web webinar. Um, so all task force members were given an, a, 
a unique link to sign in as task force members. And we've noted your attendance the best we can. I'll now read through your names and organizations and note anyone who is present or not present in attendance, as far as I can tell. If you are a substitute and we didn't recognize your attendance, please send an email to Jennifer. All right, so here we go. At the DOT, we have Christina Colon. For the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, Mario Rubio is our task force member, but James Stansberry is joining us today as his alternate. Welcome Chris Wynn with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. For the Florida Public Service Commission, Mark Futrell. As far as I can tell, um, Tim Vanderhoof has not been able to join us from Enterprise Florida, but I will double check that. Commissioner Kennard from the Hernando Citrus Metropolitan Planning Organization is not with us. But we do have Scott Coons from the North, North Central Regional Planning Council, Charles Lee from Audubon, Florida, Kent Wimmer from the Defenders of the Wildlife, Commissioner Carnahan is joining us from the Citrus County Commission, Jim Mayer is joining us from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Nancy Brown is with us this morning from the Florida Department of Education. Mike Napier is not able to join us from the Florida Department of Health. Mayor Cernsey is here with us this morning from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Jim Patton is with us from the Department of Business and Professional Regulations. Rusty Skinner it could not join us today with Career, Scores, Career Source Florida, sorry. Commissioner Bryant is here from Marion County. Warren Zwanka is here with the Suwannee River Water Management District. Jeanette Seacrest is here with us from the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Jeff Prather is not on from the St. Johns River Water Management District. Mike Woods is able to join us from the Lake Sumter Metropolitan Planning Organization. Mayor Hancher is here from the Ocala Marion County Transportation Planning Organization. I'm not sure if Rock Meeks has been able to join us yet from Levy County, but he said he would. Waiting on Sean Sullivan from the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Bradley Arnold is here from Sumter County. Phil Fulmer is here from the Florida Trucking Association. Chris Saliba is here from the Florida Water, I'm sorry, Florida Rural Water Association. Bill Ferry is here from the Florida Internet and Television Association. Danielle Ruiz is here from the Florida Economic Development Council. Kurt Williams is here from the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. Dr. Lauder is here from the College of Central Florida. Dr. Sider is here from the Lake Sumter State College. Paul Owens has joined us from 1,000 Friends of Florida. Jason Lardson is here from the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Zach Prusak is here from the Nature Conservancy. I spoke to Hugh Harling and he is expected to join us from the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. Katie Tr Trinosco will not be able to join us from Volunteer Florida. So once again, I did my very best, but if I did not call your name and you are present and on the call, please type your name and agency you represent in the chat box for me. I'll now hand it over to Jennifer Stoltz, who will take us through the presentation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Christine, and good morning, everyone. Today's webinar is focused on the process for identifying avoidance and attraction areas as input to task force recommendations. This presentation includes four key items. An update on the avoidance areas that were identified in prior task force meetings. An introduction to the attraction areas. We will also explain the purpose of introducing them to you at this point in the process. A tutorial on our online GIS tool and its new features. Use of this tool is a key component of the last topic, which is the homework process for preparation for the next meeting. As you read in the email from Tori Alston, the technical briefing will follow the webinar. We will discuss the details of that process and next steps as we prepare for task force meeting number six. 
This is how we define avoidance areas. They are places with environmental, community, or economic resources where direct impacts from enhanced or new corridors should be avoided. Here are the avoidance areas, which were introduced to you in meeting number four. FDOT has already committed to the areas that you see. As a reminder, will not impact are the areas in which there should be no impact from a transportation corridor. And no new corridor through are areas with an existing transportation corridor where no additional corridors will be proposed for the purposes of MCORs, but where existing facilities or right of way could be enhanced. Your input continues to be very important to us, and we'd like to thank you for your thoughtful deliberation in identifying additional avoidance areas to be included in the process. This slide is a representation of the online GIS tool. In meeting number four, you identified seven additional areas that you'd like to be able to view and categorize. FDOT has added the Marion County Farmland Preservation Area in the Will Not Impact category. The remaining six layers have been included in the GIS tool, and you could see a complete list of these added layers on the left of this slide. Per the discussion we had in meeting number four, we have divided Florida Forever land acquisition projects into different priority levels as indicated in the Florida Forever priority list. This slide shows an example of how the various layers come together. One example of the avoidance areas added at your request is conservation easements. We have highlighted conservation easements here in gold so that you can see how it overlays the original avoidance areas in magenta and pink. To provide you with a holistic view of attributes of the study area, we are introducing a new concept for task force consideration, attraction areas. These are also available to be viewed through the online GIS tool. Attraction areas are places where a connection to or service by an enhanced or new corridor is desired to accomplish economic, community, environmental, or other goals, such as areas targeted in local plans for economic development. The areas already included in the tool are listed here. Although we are introducing the term attraction areas to you today, many of these examples may look familiar to you. In earlier meetings, you have discussed these and we have presented them graphically on boards or in documents in your packet. The bullets on the slide have been in included as layers within the online GIS tool with some additional work done to gather location specific data where possible. You will not be asked to categorize these areas, but they will be available to you for context as you complete the homework process in following today's webinar. As we go through the tutorial for the online GIS tool, we will assist you in viewing how these layers might be helpful to you while going through the homework process. As always, your input is important to us. There may be additional attraction areas that you feel should be identified. We will discuss the opportunity to capture your thoughts on additional attraction areas when we review the homework process. Now that we have reviewed both the avoidance and attraction areas, we will move into the tutorial that will show you how you can view them while using the online GIS tool. This is an important aspect for obtaining your input following this webinar and at task force meeting number six. Today, we will run through an example of how you may use the tool. The first step is to access the tool using the web address or link that you see here. We will begin today by reviewing how to access the layers within the tool. The initial default settings in the tool will bring up the study area, the counties, existing corridors in red, and avoidance areas that have already been committed to by FDOT. To the bottom, you see four icons that represent layer lists. Will not impact areas, no new corridor through areas, Task Force number four comments, which are avoidance areas requested at meeting number four, and attraction layers. For the first step, click one of the icons to view specific layers. We're going to begin by selecting the third category, Task Force number four comments. You will see the list of the added avoidance layers that you requested. We have selected to view conservation easements, which you can now see in gold areas on the graphic. This provides you the opportunity to not only see the locations of these lands, but also to see how they may overlap and interact with the other layers. Next, we'll select attraction areas. 
In this example, we have decided to view the attraction areas called opportunity zones. You can see that these are represented by blue polygons throughout the region. These are zones identified by the U.S. Treasury where new investment is incentivized, focusing on low-income neighborhoods. In this example, you are able to view opportunity zones within proximity of some of the conservation lands. Although you are not asked to categorize the attraction areas, having a holistic view may have an impact on how you decide to categorize an avoidance area. There are a few dense layers that may take longer than others to load. We would advise against attempting to turn on all layers at once, especially multiple layers that include dense data such as census, land use, and wastewater treatment. Let's review the homework process. There are five steps that we'll briefly review. Number one, using the online GIS tool to review the avoidance and attraction layers identified to date. Number two, reviewing the avoidance areas. Number three, reviewing and prioritizing the attraction areas. Number four, participating in an individual technical briefing with the production team to review and answer your questions on the data, tool, and process. And five, preparing to categorize the avoidance areas. As a reminder, to access the online GIS tool, you will click on the link which you saw earlier in the presentation. Please familiarize yourself with the tool. Be sure to review the avoidance areas and familiarize yourself with how they are reflected in the tool. Remember, there are two different groupings of avoidance areas, those that have already been committed to by FDOT and those that you requested at meeting number four. The attraction areas that have been added to the tool are shown again here. These areas are based on data presented by FDOT or suggestions by task force members at prior meetings. If there are other attraction areas that you believe would be helpful to identify needs to be addressed by the corridor, it is important that you identify them and propose them to the task force at meeting number six. We will also review and prioritize all of the attraction areas above that are most important to you and your community or coalition. The production staff or facilitator will be in touch with you soon to set up a technical briefing at your convenience during the next few weeks. Given the current need to continue social distancing, we anticipate the briefing will be conducted via GoToMeeting, so we would suggest that you schedule it at a time when you can be in front of your computer. The briefing will review the online GIS tool and the data which has been collected, as well as address any questions you have. One key step in our homework process is to understand the four categories that you see here and to consider how you might apply them to the additional avoidance areas requested by you at meeting number four. You'll be able to share your thoughts with fellow task force members at meeting number six. The work that you are doing is critical to refining draft needs and guiding principles and developing consensus for your ultimate deliverable, the task force report. Your input will guide FDOT in later phases for identifying paths and courses, as well as implementation strategies. Let's show how this works. In past meetings, you have been providing input to drafts of both needs and guiding principles. We want to show examples of how these directly relate to the data and one another, and how these can instruct project development and implementation. Let's look at an example. Remember the avoidance area called conservation easements that we viewed before? This area contributed to identifying the first draft need shown on this slide, protection of existing conservation areas. Based on this need, a guiding principle was developed, avoid to the extent feasible and enhance to the extent practical where avoidance is not feasible, minimize and mitigate impacts to conservation areas. That principle will instruct project development and implementation. One example shown here would mean that the ultimate alignment avoids existing conservation areas to the maximum extent possible while also leveraging the ability to acquire land for preservation. Let's look at a second example. The tool includes attraction areas depicting locations of existing employers, opportunity zones, and employment rates. These areas contributed to identifying the second draft need shown on this slide, improve access to existing industries, activity centers, and isolated population centers. 
Based on this need, a draft guiding principle was developed. Give priority to and enhance potential economic development opportunities and employment benefits in the study area by providing, improving, or maintaining accessibility to activity centers, employment centers, learning institutions, agricultural lands, and locating interchanges in a manner that preserves and maintains the local land use vision and goals. One project development and implementation example for this principle could lead to an alignment or an access connection, such as a frontage road or an interchange, connecting the corridor to a regional roadway network with compatible land uses. As we continue through the remaining meetings, we will continue to work with you to ensure we are connecting the dots to indicate the relevance and importance of the work you are doing. This concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. I'd now like to turn the meeting over to Christina Cologne to discuss next steps. Thank you, Jennifer. I'd like to recap a few of the next steps before we begin the task force question and answer period. Today's presentation, webinar recording, and GIS link will be posted on the website. Our technical staff will continue to be in contact with you for any assistance you may need. I know this is a very challenging time and many of you are dealing with unusual schedules and work environments and urgent demands for your time. Please know that we are ready to adapt to your schedule and support you in any way we can. During this time to effectively stay engaged in the task force process, we will continue to explore and utilize virtual means of engagement until social distancing restrictions are loosened and allow us to meet in person again. Our goal is to resume face-to-face -face meetings in June or as soon as social distancing guidance permits us to convene. We will be looking forward to further our conversations on the homework process and finalizing needs and guiding principles in the future task force meetings. Now we will turn it over to Christine for task force member questions. Thank you, Christina. And I, I do have a clarification to make. I, I misspoke when I said that we had a chat box. We do not have a chat box. If, if we have a uh, task force member that has joined us, I've, I've caught a few more on the list. But if you can email Jennifer to let us know, hopefully I've, I've captured all of you um, and we'll work through that. So I do apologize. All right, so with me clarifying that, now it's time to open up for questions and clarifications from the task force before we begin our public comment period. In addition to Christina and Jennifer and myself and Diana that I mentioned earlier, we have the following FDOT representatives on the webinar to help answer your questions during this time. We have Will Watts, the DOT Chief Engineer, and Wei Wei Shen, the FDOT Chief Planner. We're going to go through the task force members one at a time to be sure that you have an opportunity to ask questions. And many of us have gone through the exercise of muting and unmuting, so hopefully we can get through that gracefully. The question and answer period will be related to content from today's webinar. As stated at the beginning of the webinar, you may ask questions related to the Sunshine Law as well. And remember, we will be having these technical briefings to drill down deeper on other questions. So in this new virtual world, let's give this a try. I'm gonna to try to go by like we do the public comment period. I'll announce kind of the next three task force members that we'll call upon. That might make it easier for you to be on deck and ready to unmute at your end as well. So let's go for this. Um, the first three, James, you know, you're substituting, so of course you'd be up first. James Stansberry of the Department of Economic Opportunity, then Chris Wynn, then Mark Futrell. So James, I'm gonna unmute you in case you have any questions. I don't have any questions at this time, thank you. Thank you, James. Next, Chris Wynn, Scott Coons, and then Kent Wimmer. Chris? Hey, uh, good morning, this is Chris. Maybe just one quick question about uh, future land uses. Um, I see where there's an attraction layer that identifies, you know, the broad ca categories of future land uses. Um, 
And I really think that's an important consideration moving forward, um, taking into account the local, um, you know, f future planned uses. But is there, uh, is, it, is it possible to get a little more finer detail on where utilities um, may have like 10 year future plans for growth? Uh, because some of those uh, alignments may, may be worth uh, taking a look at as we're categorizing you know some of the other other layers and making sure we're taking into account fish and wildlife uh, considerations thank you hey chris will watts here <clears throat> so we can we can certainly gather up what we can uh, certain expansion of certain utilities are proprietary um but we'll we'll see what we can gather up jennifer anything else you want to add no sir okay Any other questions, Chris? Sorry, I had him on mute. Chris, is that all? Thank you. Yes, that's all. All right, next we have Scott Coons. And uh, Scott, if you'd like to join us, you are self muted if you had any questions. Uh, Christine? Yes. Um, on the GIS tool, I noticed the, some of the layers that were listed did not include the natural resources of regional significance as identified in the strategic regional policy plans of the regional planning councils. Uh, will that be included? We, we're open to, Scott, this is Will again, we're open to any suggestions on the attraction areas. So if you've got some some additional comments to add um, when we make our rounds with our technical teams, just certainly get them to take note of what your comments are and we can add them to the tool. These are not attraction areas, these would be avoidance areas. E either way. Um, okay. E either way, we can, we can add it to the avoidance list or the attraction list. So, you know, the, the tool is very dynamic for that reason. It's we're trying to be nimble to any requests you guys have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Mark Futrell, I am so sorry I missed you. Um, if you have any questions, I am unmuting you. Just give me a second. I apologize. There you go. Do you have any questions? You are self-muted if you have a question. Good morning, Christine. I do not have any questions, but to respond to a prior question regarding uh, utility plans, the electric utilities file 10 year plans with the commission annually and those plans are currently available on the commission's website they include locations of future power plants however the information on uh, current and future transmission line corridors is very limited from what it was prior to 9 11 and so that information is is, is uh, held much more closely but i uh, just wanted to follow up with that with that question from earlier but otherwise i don't have any questions thank you Thank you. It's great to have subject matter experts on the task force. Um, the next three that I'm going to call upon are Charles Lee, Kent Wimmer, and Commissioner Carnahan. So, Commissioner um, Charles Lee, you're up. Let me unmute you just one moment. There okay. you go. Okay. Okay. I've got several uh, questions. Uh, the first one is a request. Uh, would it be possible for DOT staff to immediately after this uh, webinar send out an email to the task force members that would have in it the link to the new tool? It uh, flashed briefly up on the screen, but and I tried to take a screenshot of it. I'm not sure it succeeded, but it would be very helpful if we could just get an email with a clean link to the new tool in it. Could we get that? Hey Charles, we've got it up on the website. We can certainly send that link out, but it's 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 where we've got the first tool where we collected all the comments and then we've got the second tool for more of the selection exercise. They're both out there now. Yeah, I I looked 
I look for it on the website and maybe I missed it. It may have been a little buried, but it would just be simpler if you could send it to all the task force members just in an email. Sure, we can do that. Okay. Uh, the second uh, is a follow up question on an information request I made last week. And that is that uh, I, I know that since the advent of uh, coronavirus, uh, and the economic changes that that has portended, uh, there's been a fairly dramatic change in the collection of toll revenues on the turnpike system. I know that uh, there's a published report that uh, in the last week in March, the aggregate turnpike system collections were down 51% below what they were in the same week of March of uh, 2019. And uh, what I requested was uh, data for the weeks that are available in April for toll revenues. Would it be possible for DOT to send that information to me? And there may be other task force members that are interested as well. Hey, Charles, this is Will again. So yeah, we're we're in the process of updating all those data sets as we normally do. So as we get those updated, we'll post those just like we like we always do. They've got to be collected and quality controlled and reviewed, but uh, we're in the process of doing that. COVID certainly has had an impact on our traffic uh, short term. We're trying to understand what the long term impacts are. So just bear with us as we um, report that, understand it, and then we'll get that publicly out to everybody. My, yeah, if, if you could email that to me in response to my request when it's available, I'd greatly appreciate it. Okay. Well, uh, the, the third uh, point that I have is a, is a question. Uh, when I went through the exercise that was sent out, there was a webinar exercise that I think many of us, if not all of us, went through that was sort of a preview of this meeting. Um, there were some content and slides in that exercise that have not been displayed this morning. And specifically, the ones that I'm referring to are uh, the land use maps of the counties, which were all unified in one uh, map showing the entire study area for the turnpike. Uh, and then the second uh, layer of content that was emphasized in that earlier uh, webinar uh, was the um, uh, was the transportation need projections out to 2050, uh, which showed, for example, uh, the US 19 corridor uh, being uh, with apparently no need for improvement out to 2050 with regard to traffic uh, load. Uh, and it showed other areas that were very congested in contrast. But, but nonetheless, that data was very helpful. And I'm wondering why we did not have that uh, presented this morning when it seemed to be uh, pre-presented in that earlier um, in that earlier webinar exercise, those of us that did it uh, saw. So great question, Charles. What we what we attempted to do was to get two of the task force corridors up to speed, kind of the same time frame of when COVID took effect to Florida. So we we did have a face to face for the Southwest Central Florida task force in the beginning of March, and then in an attempt to get the other two task teams up to speed. We chose a virtual delivery method using uh, computer-based training, and that way we could track questions and concerns as they were doing that training. We're, we're trying to get all the task force members to complete that, and we're getting close, and then we will post that on the internet for public view. It'll probably just be a few days from now, but we're, we're real close. We just wanna make sure the task force members get through that. Okay, well, I thought it was very, very instructive and, and very helpful. And, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, so I presume when we have the individual interviews, uh, that data will be up and that will be part of the discussion at the time? Yeah, I don't see why we can't get it up by the end of the week. We were just trying to really encourage participation and, and so we're, we're getting close on that. Okay. Uh, 
thank you very much. That's uh, my input for today. Thank you, Charles. Um, I do apologize. Kent Wimmer is having a little bit of technical difficulties. He's with the Defenders of the Wildlife. We'll try to loop back with him if he has any questions before we close out this portion. So we'll next go to Commissioner Carnahan. And then after that, Jim Mayer. Um, Commissioner, if you can just give me a second to unmute you. Good. Okay, Good can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I don't have anything. Um, I, I do want to make a comment. Um, you know, I, I appreciate Charles, Charles Lee's comments on the tolls being down 51%. Um, but you know, when, when we got a stay at home order and, and nobody's traveling, they're going to be down. Um, you know, as soon as this is lifted, you know, you're going to see your tolls come back. You know, I mean, we, we can look at the businesses across the uh, state uh, and, and they're probably down 90%. So, so I, I, you know, I appreciate we, we need to see those revenues, but unfortunately in a time like this, I don't, I don't think it really matters uh, when we're trying to fight an epidemic. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. So next we'll go to Jim Mayer, then Nancy Brown. Jim, if you give me just a quick second. There you go, I've unmuted you. Thank you, um, good morning again. Um, I don't have any questions. I did wanna add um, to what a past force member um, earlier address for an original question about what the utility growth mode might look like. Someone weighed in on the electrical um, growth for wastewater. One source to do that, that information would be the capacity analysis reports that each of the utilities are required to file for their uh, wastewater permits. So that's a, a potential source to look at what plans are there um, of varying quality um, depending upon how much planning each individual community does, but uh, it's uh, one place to look. And that's all I have. Excellent, thank you for sharing. All right, we'll go to Nancy Brown next. And then after that, it looks like Michael Napier was able to join us. Nancy, if you give me just a second, I'll unmute you. There we go. Good morning. My um, question goes back to, um, I guess, one that was asked earlier. The, um, the information that was kind of covered this morning, are we going to get that sent out to us as, as a whole, or is it already posted somewhere where we can go back to make sure that we're um, able to, for our homework information? Yeah, great question. So we're going to continue to post everything we present on the website and then you'll have an opportunity with your technical sessions to ask any more detailed or um, dive a little deeper in any, any type of questions or concerns. So those should be up there already, um, at least today's slides. And then what Charles was referring to was this, the uh, computer-based training and we'll get that up by the end of the week. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Next is Michael Napier. Let me unmute. Michael, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, thanks and uh, apologize for being on a little bit late. Um, uh, I have no questions and um, as the director of the public health department here in Pasco County, I want to continue to encourage everyone to uh, follow the rules of social distancing and we continue to uh, beat this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. We have heard uh, Kent emailed um, because of his technical difficulties. I'm going to read on his behalf if everyone will uh, be okay with that. He said that his comment is that I have many questions about the maps and categorization categorization that I would like to discuss with staff from both task forces I serve at the same time. 
So um, for those of you that do serve on more than one, that is very much our goal, is to coordinate schedules so that we minimize the impact of your time as well as we're able to provide as comprehensive of a view as possible. So thank you, Kent, for that. So uh, the next three I have on my list are uh, Matt Cernsey. Matt, if you give me just a second to unmute you. There we go. Can you hear us, Matt? I can hear you fine. And uh, I don't have any questions. I appreciate the uh, staff putting together all that information for us. Thank you, Mayor. All right, next I have Jim Patton and, and Commissioner Bryant. If you give us just a moment to unmute you. Jim, can you hear us? I can, and thank you for the opportunity, but I have uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Bryant. You may have us on mute. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. I'm good. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have Warren Zwanka and then Jeanette Seacrest. Warren, I've unmuted you if you have any questions. I don't. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure thing. Next, we have Jeanette Seacrest and then Jeff Prather has been able to join us. So, Jeanette? Good morning. I do not have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeff, I do apologize. I missed you on the roll call. Do you have any questions of us? Uh, I do not. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. The next few we have are Jeff Woods. Um, I, I heard from Commissioner Meeks, but I have not been able to see him log on. So Mike Woods is in Valerie Hancher. Mike, do you have any questions? This is Mike Woods. Uh, no questions. I appreciate the hard work on the GIS online tool. I look forward to working with that. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Valerie Hancher. Hey, good morning. No, ma'am, I have no questions. Um, definitely appreciate all the hard work and we'll look forward to talking to y'all one on one. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, next, I have Sean Sullivan. Sean, if you give me just a second to unmute you. There we go. Good morning. Sean, do you have any questions for the team? Thank you. We're going to move on um, to Bradley Arnold. Bradley, if you give me just a second to unmute you. There we go. Can you hear us? Yes, I just have um, two comments. One, I want to express my appreciation to Will and Weiwei. Um, I think that the teams have done a really good job, uh, particularly after our last meeting. Um, I think the uh, preparation information was very helpful, and this uh, homework review, if you will, uh, was very clear. So just want to express my appreciation. Thank you, Bradley. So next we have uh, Phil Fulmer and then Chris Saliba. Phil, if you give me just a second. There we go. Can you hear us? I hear you. Um, I don't really have any questions other than some comments. Uh, some of them were the same that um, Mr. Lee uh, voiced about the uh, tool and the using of the tool and, and um, and some items that were uh, missing. Uh, although I agree, the uh, the presentation um, uh, that we had for homework was very well put together. Uh, 
Um, so I understand that you got to kind of condense it a little bit. Um, some other comments I had, um, as we move forward, I'd like to see more. I, I represent trucking, obviously, so I'm, I'm talking about trucking. Uh, I'd like to see more of um, trucking areas, parking areas. I know we, as we get into these rural areas, that's some of the concerns the people have in these areas is the traffic and the amount of trucks that come through there. And, and, and um, some of the states have trucking only parking off of these areas, off these roads. Uh, some states don't. I've seen some close lately, which I don't appreciate because truck parking is the number one problem in trucking today. It is huge. Um, so I, I'd like to see some more on that or what we're going to do about truck parking. Um, and then as far as tolls, uh, the comment was made about the tolls were down. Um, as some of you know, I own two different trucking companies. One of them in, uh, is all refrigerated. One is all drive-in. The, the drive-in business uh, during this COVID is down probably 25%, maybe more. Uh, on the other hand, the refrigerated business is up about 40%. So um, it's kind of a give and take. And I think as soon as we're all over, over with this, uh, this pandemic, I think it'll all come back around. But um, other than that, I, I enjoyed, enjoyed uh, uh, getting on the, the uh, webinar today, and I think it's very well put together. That's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. The next few we have are Chris Liba, Bill Ferry, and Danielle Ruiz. So, Chris? Thank you. Good morning. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you so much. Bill Ferry? Uh, yeah, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Danielle Ruiz, do you have any questions of us? Yes, hi, good morning. Uh, I just want to thank you for taking uh, all the suggestions that were made in the last task force meeting and implementing them into today's updates. Um, and I have no questions either. Thank you. The next few we have are Kurt Williams, Vernon Lauter, and Stanley Sider. So, Kurt, do you have any questions? Uh, good morning. No, I don't have any questions, but I, I would like to make a comment. Um, you know, given this current pandemic um, and, and us all feeling the effects of the things that I've been talking about, uh, how important agriculture is, uh, I just, just want to remind everyone of just how important it is for um, the local agriculture in the state. Uh, and how we've we've all been waiting in lines at the grocery store uh, for food, you know. And, and I appreciate you guys putting the uh, the prime agriculture lands on these layers uh, of avoidance and the other agriculture lands. Uh, and you know, just now more than ever, I just just wanted to drive that point home that we need to be very uh, cognizant of of the agriculture lands across the state as we put put the path of this road through. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauder. I have no additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sider. Well, thank you. I just wanted to thank you all for, for putting the information packet together that we could reach online, and I do not have any questions. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Paul Owens, Jason Lordson, and Zach Prusak. Paul? Thanks, Christine. Um, I noticed on the map that we are going to be adding to as part of our homework assignment that there is a big chunk, a big magenta chunk to correspond, I think, to the farmland preservation area in Marion County. And Commissioner Bryant did a great job at the last meeting uh, making it clear that that uh, area should be off the table. Uh, I still do not see any area, unless I'm missing it, that corresponds to the Springs Protection Zone in Levy County that uh, is part of their comprehensive plan there. So I'm wondering um, why that's uh, missing from the map and whether it's going to be added. So Paul, we can we can add that to uh, the task force comment layer easily. So not a, not a, not an issue. Okay, thanks, Will. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Paul.
Yes, this is Jason from the Florida Wildlife Corridor, and I don't have any questions or comments at the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Zach Prusak. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, no specific questions. I guess maybe just one general question that maybe no one knows is what will the impact of the uncertainty um, with the state budget um, have on this entire project? So Zach, great question, Will Watts again. So, <clears throat> you know, this M course has to still meet both financial and or financial and environmental feasibility, just like any other project. So, you know, you've heard me mention it many times that, you know, we can't build anything we can't afford. So all forecasting is gonna be readjusted based on short-term COVID and long-term projections. And then we, once we get further down the line of corridor development, then we price it out and see how we finance it. So. It's still it's still pretty early, is is really the summation of that. And as we get further down, we still got to afford it. So, all right, thanks. I realized I may have missed Sean Sullivan. Sean, have you? Do you have any questions? Sean, did you have any questions? I, I see your hand is raised. Can you hear us? Sean, I commit to follow up with you to uh, work through any questions. I, we, we must be having some technical difficulty. If you can give me just a second. Sean, can you hear us? All right, and, and the other member, um, I, Rock Meeks was planning on joining us and I, I've not been able to see him on the list, so. If anyone has any secondary questions, I think we've gone through the entire list now. We have the opportunity to raise the hands by task force members. So I'll look through real quickly. If you have any follow-up questions that came about of the conversations that we've had today, go ahead and use the raise hand element within the webinar. And I really appreciate you all being patient as we navigate all of this. I do not currently see any follow-up questions. So thank you very much for your patience through all of this and the content and the question and answers for today. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Christina. All right, thank you. This concludes our formal presentation for today. We will now move on to the public comment portion of our webinar. I want to continue to emphasize how important this input is to the process and that public comment during our meetings and webinars is not the only way for the public to provide their input to us. Public comments may be submitted at any time to f.listens at dot.state.fl.us and will become part of the public record. Christine, let's please go ahead and begin the public comment period. Thank you, Christina. All right, so here we go into the public comment period. As I mentioned earlier, we've received 134 requests to provide public comment, which will take approximately six and a half hours, assuming everyone uses a three minute allocation. As always, we encourage everyone to stay engaged during this portion of the webinar. Request to comment that were received by five o'clock yesterday will be addressed during the public comment period to in, in order to, in the order the requests were made. If you did not respond, if you do not respond when your name is called, we will provide a second chance at the end of the public comment period. We will identify the next three speakers so that you may prepare to comment. When your name is called to actually speak, 
we will unmute your line in order for you to provide comment within an allotted time of three minutes. You'll hear a very faint tone at 30 seconds remaining and then another tone when your time is up. The line will then be muted at three minutes. Please keep your eye on the clock and listen to the tones if you can. If you have more information to share with the group, you can provide additional comments in writing for further consideration. And as always, you can send comments anytime to fdotlistens at dot state.fl.us. Only one person at a time will be unmuted. If you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. If you did not submit your request in time to be able to speak today, please email your comments to fdot.listens.dot.state.fl.us. All right, so we are going to identify the first three names. We have, I'm sorry, I, I, it's Ethan Gilbert, Levi Hannon, and then Chris Costello. Ethan? Ethan, you're unmuted. Okay, next up, Levi Hannon. Levi, you are unmuted. Next up, Chris Costello. Chris, you are unmuted. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, Chris Costello from the Sierra Club. I live in Sarasota County. Um, for all um, of us, our economy has all been shut down and people are fighting for their lives or terrified that this virus will take a loved one but FDOT has a webinar to keep the MCORS process going um, and with task force members doing homework and briefings um, and completing them out of public view. I hate to be flip, but really? Uh, the task force process was opaque and fruitless through seven months of in-person meetings. And while FDOT staff may be thrilled that the webinar has removed the public's right to visually display their opposition outside of the public comment period, the public is not thrilled. This webinar adds insult to injury. It is the opposite of democracy in action. I expect task force members and FDOT staff who actually believe in transparency, democracy, and the responsibility of the state government to provide for its citizens to demand, demand that this farce end, end now. Exit now, call it off now. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Brian Barnes. Next up is Sandra Hodge from Coral Gables, Florida. Next up, Jackson Hurst from Kennesaw, Georgia. Next up, Margo. Robinson from Newport Ritchie, Florida.
Next up is Cameron Monroe from Fort Myers, Florida. Cameron, sorry, Carmen, you are unmuted. Carmen Monroe, you are unmuted. And no comment, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Dennis Blake from Old Town, Florida. Next up is Stella Myers from Fort Myers, Florida. Next up is Marion Ryan from Winter Haven, Florida. Next is Pat Branch from Tampa, Florida. Next is George Neves from Danellan, Florida. Next up is Eugene Kelly from Brooksville, Florida. Eugene, you are Good morning. unmuted. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Gene Kelly speaking for the Florida Native Plant Society. I've spoken at pretty much every meeting thus far uh, on behalf of the society and focused on natural resource issues, but I really want to point to a different concern that I have, and that's that's the assumptions that are underlying this entire process, the entire need to develop these roads. Uh, we make the assumption that building a road is somehow necessary to bring broadband to rural communities, as one example. The assumption that I think is most dangerous, though, is the one about the rate of growth in, in Florida. I've heard at probably every single task force meeting, one local government representative on the task force stand up and comment about uh, 900 or 1,000 new residents moving into Florida every single day, and that, that just is not going to stop. It's going to be growth as far as the eye can see. I think at this moment in time, uh, you know, the, the point's already been made. We see a drop in tolls fewer people on the roads. Well, I think there are going to be fewer people moving to Florida. So the simple reality of the economic hit that uh, this pandemic is going to create. Now that may be short term, long term. The one thing we know for sure is that there will be other unforeseen events. Uh, a hurricane is one example that could you know, flatten that curve in growth. I think it's dangerous for us to assume that there is this tremendous urgency for this process to move forward to accommodate growth that we assume is coming. Uh, there are so many factors that could change that above and beyond events like a pandemic or a hurricane or, or some other uh, recession causing event. Uh, the Bieber projections for population growth, I'm not sure to, to what extent they take into account demographic changes, economic changes that are happening north of Florida, uh, the source of all this immigration that we're predicting is going to occur. I would really hope that uh, the task force members could look beyond these kinds of assumptions and see that there's really no need for this sense of urgency. Slow this process down. Recommend a no-build alternative. There will still be time if these projections really come to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Next up is John Kilgore from Top Tarpoon Springs, Florida.
Next up is Saban Gale from Lakeland, Florida. Next up is Thomas Lochran from Winter Park, Florida. Next up is Delita Sang from Ocoee, Florida. Next up is Alex Priester from Winter Park, Florida. Next up is George Kane from Tampa, Florida. Next up is Michael McGrath from Fort Myers, Florida. Michael, you are unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Hello, my name is Michael McGrath. And I'm an organizer from the Sierra Club, and I'm a resident of Lee County. I've become passionate to promote MCORs by holding rural communities hostage by forcing the choose between broadband connectivity and highways that run straight through the backyard or no broadband at all. This is no choice at all because it's just not the truth. There are alternatives that are both cheaper, less environmentally damaging, and can accomplish the same goal. Aerial broadband, for example, is a well-documented service that can be done independently of road construction and for a fraction of the cost. We need real solutions, not toll roads to ruin. I urge you not to build this project and, to, and find other alternatives that can accomplish um, broadband connectivity for rural communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGrath. Next up is Lindsey Cross from St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, Ms. Cross. Good morning. This Good morning, this is Lindsay Cross with Florida Conservation Voters. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you virtually today and appreciate your attention. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is certainly demonstrating just how vulnerable our state can be. Research from the Harvard University School of Public Health recently demonstrated a link between poor air quality and increased mortality from COVID-19. Abundant and fresh clean water is critical for us to maintain good personal hygiene. And we also know how having a reliable food source from our local Florida farms can enhance our food security. All of these things will be in jeopardy if we build this road. The benefits that are promised to these small rural communities like broadband come with too many strings attached. Levy County Commission recently took the bold and brave step of passing a no-build resolution this month because the residents there understand that the cost greatly outweigh the lauded benefits, which are based more on assumption than on fact. Residents in other parts of this and other corridors are also speaking up, and I would encourage you to listen to them because they know what is right for their community. Our state will be grappling with economic uncertainty for years to come, and we still don't know how and when we will be reopening our state. The legislature and FDOT have never been able to show that this project is economically viable. During ec good economic times, this project is wasteful and unnecessary. Now, during a global health and economic crisis, building these roads would be negligent. Task force members, as you are challenged to look at both avoidance and attraction areas, I think the homework should actually be quite easy. Color the entire four county area in dark magenta for avoidance because the only thing we can guarantee that this project will attract is more destruction of our natural areas, degradation of our water resources, and the dismantling of rural lifestyles. Let's stop the charade and say no to the roads to ruin. As always, and even more so now, the only responsible option is no build. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Cross. Next up is Joseph Sheffield from Old Town, Florida. Next up is Nancy Apalach from Lake Panascoffee, Florida.
Next up, Michael Sachs from Ocala, Florida. Next up is Lynn Spark from Monticello, Florida. Next up, Bob Fink from Tampa, Florida. Next up is Tzekio Mirowski from Okoli, Florida. Ezekiel, you are unmuted. Mr. Mirowski, you are unmuted. Last call, Mr. Murawski. Moving on, Kimberly Heath from Delray Beach, Florida. Kimberly, you are unmuted. Hi, Hi thank you. Um, I spoke yesterday uh, about the Florida Panther because that's what the road was gonna impact, uh, the one that's in the South. These ones, uh, they go through the, um, they go through a lot of other habitat. The, 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 all the habitat that is being impacted is part of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Um, it's like just going directly through it. Um, if you want a map, I noticed that you put on existing conservation and agriculture areas, um, and that's good. Just put the entire Florida um, Wildlife Corridor on the map because we can't rely on uh, the state of Florida and the existing conservation lands that we have to influence us. Florida has defunded uh, the, you know, the land acquisition programs for 10 years and land that should be protected is not. We have, people have been working so, so hard to get the land in this wildlife corridor, corridor protected. Um, things like the Florida black bear, you know, you, you grow up um, as a child and you learn about these animals and you imagine them just kind of like living their lives, you know, out in the wilderness not like on the brink of extinction and the florida panther is on the brink of it will become extinct if you build the especially the south road but these roads up here are going to imperil the black bear and can you imagine a world where black bears are endangered that's crazy i mean they used to be on the endangered species list here but now they're not there's like four thousand in the state right now but they live in like these isolated pockets of like a few hundred um which is bad because if anything happens to those pockets the whole thing will like collapse um, so it's the last best hope for these black bears and a lot of other species is the Florida Wildlife Corridor, which this road and the other roads go directly through. Um, I don't want to live in a world where we have to fight this hard to protect the remaining wildlife that we have um, and just to protect normal animals like the black bear. This whole thing, like people, you guys working so hard to create the constraints around this project that is just so destructive. It's, it's so upsetting. I work with kids and when I teach them about Florida's animals, I don't tell them how imperiled the black bear is or the Florida panther because it's traumatic. It's traumatic for me. And um, if someone's growing up in Florida, it's just, it's just, it's so hard for me. It's, and I'm gonna, I'm honestly gonna try my hardest to fight this. The fact that these are online is the only reason why I can be here because I work. Um, so I hope that you continue to do these online things and please put the entire, put the entire um, wildlife corridor on your map and don't go through it, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heiss. Next up is Ned Bayer. Mr. Bear, you're unmuted. 
Ned Beer, you are unmuted. No questions, no please. Questions. Thank you. Next up is Chad Turner. Next up is Chuck Dixon from Lacanto, Florida. Next up is Pamela McElroy from Gainesville, Florida. Next up is A. Warren from Homestead, Florida. Next up is Loretta Welpin from Homosassa, Florida. Next up is Kim Wheeler from Williston, Florida. Kim? You are unmuted. Miss Wheeler from Gaines from Williston, Florida, you are unmuted. Last call for Kim Wheeler from Williston, Florida. Next up is Helen Hoffman from the Villages, Florida. Next up is Lisa DiCarlio from Fort Myers, Florida. Next up is Mark Haver from Lake Lakeland, Florida. Mr. Haver, you are unmuted. Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Thank you. First of all, I would like to comment on the nature of these meetings and them being online. There have been several comment periods and meetings before the pandemic that were honestly very inaccessible to anyone working a full-time job or to any college students because they would be placed in the middle of the workday, in the middle of the week, in places that might be one to two hours away from a place where my college is. And so, I know that a lot of people are saying that they prefer the in-person meetings, but this is really the only chance that I would get to provide my public comment in this type of forum. I know that there's f.listens and I have sent my comments to that email, but I really do like the fact that this is way more accessible to way more people and that this actually does give me the opportunity to voice my opposition to these crazy toll roads. I paid like $60 to drive to, to Cocoa Beach on I-4. I do not want to be paying for more tolls in the state of Florida. I think that we're wasting money on infrastructure that should be redirected to improving what's already existing for climate resilience and investing in public transit. I'm originally from the DC metro area. I loved, loved being able to just travel around DC, Maryland, Virginia on a really efficient type of subway. In Florida, we have absolutely nothing of the sort. We don't even have good public bus systems. I live in an area right between Tampa and Orlando, and I know that that's not what this corridor is for, but I think it's ridiculous that we're not applying any types of solutions, any types of solutions for public transit to connect those types of corridors in a way that's carbon neutral, in a way that's better for the environment, 
we're trying to encourage urban sprawl with more of these types of corridors. And I don't think that's the progress that we should be making as Floridians. We should be cognizant of the ways in which that these roads are detrimental to the future of Florida's public health with the different types of emissions that are associated with increased traffic. We should be cognizant of the ways in which that this is retroactively working against what we need to adequately uh, do to prepare our infrastructure in Florida for things like sea level rise, for things like hurricanes, for things like increased precipitation. And I just don't think that these roads are a good idea. They do so much to fragment the habitat. They do so much to degrade the habitat. It goes right through the Florida wildlife corridor. It's bad for panthers. It's bad for black bears. This is just a terrible proposition that I don't see any benefits related to except for the trucking and asphalt lobbies. So with that, I must say that everyone should exit now and that these roads will lead to ruin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haver. Next up, Joni Moran from Florida. Next up is Drew Martin from Lake Worth, Florida. Next up is Richard Packman from Clearwater, Florida. Next up is Ted Greenwald from High Springs, Florida. Next up is Steve Nolan from Tallahassee, Florida. Mr. Nolan, you are unmuted. You are self-muted. Mr. Steve Nolan, you are unmuted on our end if you'd like to unmute on your end so you can speak. Moving on, Joni Rampolia from Jupiter, Florida. Next up, a key Andrews from Sebastian, Florida. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Kay Andrews. I live in Sebastian, Florida. I was born and raised on Florida's East Coast. You heard me speak out against the Southwest Central Florida Connector in yesterday's task force meeting. You'll know that after living in Germany for about 15 years, I recently moved back with my husband and son so that my almost four year old son can experience un Florida's unique ecosystems. Despite the popular images of Florida associating the state solely with beaches and palm trees, every one of us, visitors to the state included, quickly becomes keenly aware of the slash pines towering over us. But Florida once looked very different from today. It was actually longleaf pine, not slash pine, that was once dominant in Florida. But due to massive land conversion for development, agriculture, and timber production, Florida's historical landscape has changed, and now longleaf pine has been reduced. Unmuted. Okay, Andrews, somehow we had some technical difficulties and you were muted. Do you want to start over? Okay, we, you are unmuted. Okay, now I'm unmuted again. Somehow I got muted. I'll um, skip the intro of who I am. I think you guys know that. Go ahead. Okay, 
Um, so I was talking about how, um, you know, we see a lot of slash pine now. It used to actually be longleaf pine, not slash pine. It was once dominant in Florida and due to massive land conversion for development, agriculture, and timber. Um, this has changed and uh, longleaf pine has been reduced to just 3% of its natural range that used to be over 90 million acres in southeastern United States. I also mentioned that you might be thinking that one pine species is as good as any other, but each of them has their own unique role to play in Florida's diverse ecosystems, um, which is what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, the University of North Florida calls longleaf pine habitats one of the most endangered habitats in Florida. According to the FNAI, all of the counties that would be impacted by the Northern Turnpike Connector have occurrences of longleaf pine ecosystem sites with only few of these already included in designated conservation areas. Healthy longleaf pine communities need controlled burns to ensure that the unique grassy and wildflower understory at the feet of these majestic pines can outcompete other trees and shrubs and without a healthy understory which can contain up to 50 different plant species in just one square meter the biodiversity in longleaf pine communities plummets. The degradation and fragmentation of our remaining longleaf pine communities also directly and negatively impacts the animals that call them home, such as the federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker and the threatened pine snake, as well as the threatened gopher tortoise and the myriad of species that depend on them in their burrows, including the federally threatened eastern indigo snake and the threatened dusky gopher frog. Due to the urban sprawl that inevitably accompanies these types of projects, if it is built, the proposed Northern Turnpike Connector will make it even more difficult to perform the controlled burns that are required to maintain healthy longleaf pine habitat. Already drastically reduced due to historical development, the Northern Turnpike Connector would also mean further degradation, fragmentation, or complete destruction of longleaf pine habitat, again, in the name of development. In closing, I don't live near the proposed Northern Turnpike Connector or its equally misguided sister projects, the Southwest Central Florida and Suncoast Connectors, but I care deeply about protecting Florida's unique ecosystems and the plants and animals that call them home. Even if these roads avoid longleaf pine habitat and other ecologically sensitive sites that may or may not already be conserved and may or may not have been identified as quote unquote avoidance areas, New roads constitute major barriers to the movement and survival of Florida's unique plants and animals. For these and more reasons, I urge you, members of this task force, to recommend against further habitat destruction in our state, and I implore you to strongly recommend no build. It is the only option for this environmentally and financially unfeasible project. Let's invest in maintaining our present transportation infrastructures instead of roads to ecological ruin. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Adam Morley from St. Augustine, Florida. Next up is Russell Hyatt from Bradenton, Florida. Next up is Tammy Cook Whedon from Okeechobee, Florida. Next up is John Olson from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Next up is Autumn Martinez from Jacksonville, Florida. Next up is Laura Duplain from Tampa, Florida. Next up is Robert Lopez from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Next up is Larry Grossman from Sarasota, Florida.
Next up is Juana Barron from Tavares, Florida. Next up is Catherine Beck from Tallahassee, Florida. Next up is Jen Lumpert from St. Augustine, Florida. Next, next up is Joyce Palmer from Crystal River, Florida. Next up is Maura Crystal from Gainesville, Florida. Next up is Michael Crow from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Next up is Willie the Lucin from Hawthorne, Florida. Next up is Robert Roscoe from Hamden, Connecticut. Robert, you are on Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this is my first uh, meeting, and uh, but uh, basically, I grew up in Citrus County. I used to have cattle in Sumter County and uh, farmed uh, the end of uh, Turner Camp Road, which goes to Lithicoochee River, uh, Gum Slough, canoed down uh, Potts Preserve. I was a friend of the owners. That was 9,000 acres. Uh, we're looking at an area here that is loaded with conservation lands after you get off the turnpike you somehow have to get over Lake uh, Sofke uh, and I'm not really sure what rural people you're going to help out here or having fiber optic uh, basically it, it's pretty wild land uh, until you get Citrus Springs and Citrus County and uh, then north of there is Marion Oaks. And then you get to 200, and basically you have Halapata on the north side, which is red cockaded woodpeckers, et cetera. Then you have on the south side, uh, basically uh, uh, private lands. And I'm not sure, I mean, a premise of this whole thing is that DOT knows where hurricanes are going. And I don't know why people would want to take a, a hurricane evacuation route to where basically Michael went, uh, which went from uh, uh, Panama City all the way up to Virginia, killing 46 people. Uh, Irma uh, wiped out um, a couple of billion acres going into Georgia. Uh, I talked to the Georgia TOT when they started. They didn't even know about this project. And basically, no one has talked today about this connector going across. And the other thing I've been uh, fighting the Suncoast to, uh, basically, the uh, 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 Sunshine Law has been a joke. I had a lawsuit that I won against that. They haven't done any of it. Also, these are not four lane roads, they're eight lane roads. Uh, that's what the Swift Bud drainage permits are for. So let's talk about what's really going on and not four lane roads for some trucks. Also, uh, basically you're making a dike uh, when you finally get to US 19 and it's right on the Gulf Coast where it's prone to hurricanes, it's lowland, uh, a lot of that is pulpwood land, et cetera. And I just don't, I mean, unless you have a computer program that can predict hurricanes, uh, I went to the Abacos uh, there is no Abacos. Marsh Harbor's gone. Uh, it's just like Panama City. And so anyway, I, and I'm just surprised that no one has even talked about this border today. And I hope the GIS is available on the website. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roscoe. Next up, Byron Flagg from Gainesville, Florida. Next up, Sarah Maples from Sarasota, Florida. Sarah, you are online, but you have not entered the pin to communicate. If you want to hang up and dial back in, we will call you on the next round. Moving on, Alyssa Anderson from Gainesville, Florida. Next up is John Wade from Inverness, Florida. You are unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I want to thank FDOT for putting together the absolute worst webinar that I have ever attended. And in the last month, I've attended quite a few. So hopefully you will improve them. They had no visuals, absolutely no visuals. My concern is that our budget is not going to be what it was before this pandemic. We've heard nothing about making any kind of adjustments to this roadway because of that. Now that begs the question also of the need for these roads. We don't seem to have any indica any information on the need for these roads. Also, just as a housekeeping matter, when the commission, when the uh, panel members are speaking, would you please identify where they're from or who they're representing? Because just to call a name means nothing to us. It seems to me that these, these things have been designed to really eliminate the public. And I very much resent that. I've been to every meeting, at least the extension and the um, northern corridor. So hopefully you will do better in the future. I can read slides just as well as anyone, but there was no maps, there was no indication what you were talking about, what we were looking at, what we should have been looking at. That's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Cindy Vieira from Ocala, Florida. Next up is Chris McCurdy from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Next up is Carl Hildebrand from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Next up is Margot Leeser from Bartow, Florida. Next up is Mark McQueen from Panama City, Florida. Next up is Meredith, Meredith Budd from Naples, Florida.
Next up is Erica McCaughey from Bon Bonita Springs, Florida. Next up is Larry Schwartz from Ponte Vedra, Florida. Next up is Carol Pratt from Naples, Florida. Next up is Bill Keating from Miami Beach, Florida. Next up is Karen Shearer from Fort Myers, Florida. Next up is Caroline Torello from Tallahassee, Florida. Next up is Adrian Barman from Hollywood, Florida. Adrian, you are unmuted. You hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, hi. Um, I'm, I'm one of two things. I'm a member of the Broward Sierra Club, and I'm also a registered nurse for 38 years. So my question is, why are we rushing this COVID-19? It's a global pandemic impacting people's lives and our economy. As a nurse on the front lines with COVID-19, I believe our resources should be spent on addressing our public health emergency, what we're going through, or our devastated economy, not on toll roads that no one wants. The task forces have been meeting since August and there is no data establishing the need for these toll roads. What we really need now is relief from the COVID-19 impacts. Our current state of emergency shows that we have critical needs to be met. Call off MCORs and redirect the tax dollars. Our agriculture, we're seeing on TV, it's vital to our state and national food security. And right now the farmers, farmers are throwing out crops because of the virus. There's less demand. They are being forced to waste these crops. What about the surface water and the groundwater quality? Uh, is, is the runoff gonna go into the springs? Is it gonna go into the lakes and estuaries? And, and by the way, panthers, deer, bears, alligators, they don't know how to cross over a highway. They've never learned that. And, and if you, there is in the Florida Fish and Wildlife, you could get a report of road kills, and there's a lot of them, especially on the panthers. And finally, our state is heating up and we are doing more asphalt to contribute to the heat. We're putting on more roads. I think the legislatures who approve this project are blinded to climate change and climate resiliency. And the last thing I wanna say as a parent, I have three kids and one, my son, who's in his fourth year of medical school, wants to move here and be an orthopedic surgeon. And I fear for him because I don't know if he could be able to live a quality of life here anymore. It's heating up and there's no plans for climate resiliency or, or climate change in this state. I know because I went to Tallahassee in January. So it's very disturbing to me that this, this here we are built, adding something else. This governor needs to open up his eyes and, and not focus on, on money and, and development. I hope all of you are listening to this. It's so important. And all of you who have children, please keep the fight up. We have to stop the building of these roads. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barman. Next up is Tim Novak from Odessa, Florida. Next up is JT Shields from Tallahassee, Florida.
Next up is Doc Phillips from Chieflin, Florida. Next up is Matthew Schwartz from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Next up is Daryl Barwish from Tallahassee, Florida. Next up is Ryan Orgera from Sanibel, Florida. Next up is Naveen Norway from St. Petersburg, Florida. Next up is Stephen Leidner from Miami, Florida. Next up is Janet Barrow from Danella, Florida. Janet, you are unmuted. Yes, hello? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay, Janet Barrow, rural grandmother, where I'm on a cattle ranch and it's easy to stay at home and provide for myself in rural central Florida. It's annoying that the MCORS process is continuing at this time. It should be put on hold if not ended. We citizens have more pressing things to do rather than to help FDOT facilitate the process for three unwanted, unneeded roads that don't make good economic sense. So do the task force members and the FDOT employees. The UF study for projected growth in Florida used to justify MCORs was based on conditions that no longer apply. We're in a global pandemic. These are uncertain times and things could even get worse. This pandemic will have lasting repercussions, especially for Florida, which is largely dependent on tourism and travel. Will tourism continue to be our number one industry since it relies on discretionary income and concentrates people in close quarters where disease can flourish? Will people continue to flock to attractions as they once did? Will cruises have the same appeal they once did? Will people reprioritize their spending? What will happen in the real estate sector as tech startups, commercial and retail businesses fail? What, will, what effects will there be on residential real estate sales and resales? There is a lot that remains to sort itself out. Our number two industry, agriculture, is vital critical infrastructure. Often overlooked, will rural land, soil, and water become valued more, preserved, and protected? New toll roads are not needed for agricultural distribution. The problem lies in the processing plants that have become so large and centralized, crowded with assembly line working conditions. We have lost many of our local agricultural markets in the name of progress. I know because I've watched them disappear during our decades of farming and ranching. The cattle market has been hit with a drop in price of about a third to 40% since the beginning of the year due to COVID-19 bottlenecks at these centralized packing plants. It's not a problem with production on the farm. It's a problem there with this. We need to get to more local um, food sources. So don't let agriculture continue to be squeezed out in the name of development. Don't go from cattle to rooftops like the MCOR's feature speaker from Pasco County boasted about in Fanning Springs. We must also protect our water recharge areas and springs protection zones. We're in a crisis. I admonish the state to get its priorities straight. The task force and FDOT need the courage to recommend no build at this time. Thank you, Ms. Barrow. Next up is Julene Beck from Miami, Florida. Next up is Charles Stone from Fort Myers, Florida.
Next up is Debbie Cope from Fort Myers, Florida. Debbie, you are unmuted. You are self-muted if you want to unmute on your end. Debbie Cope from Fort Myers, Florida, you are unmuted. You are self-muted if you want to unmute on your end. Last call for Debbie Cope. Moving on, John Jermer from Tampa, Florida. Next up is Linda Smythe from Florida. Next up is Whitney Springer from Gainesville, Florida. Next up is Mary Shabbat from Punta Gorda, Florida. Mary, you are unmuted. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yes, I do not live in one of the m -Corp counties, but I care about this issue. It seems to me that agriculture is a vital industry for the state, and agricultural lands need to be protected, not paved over. And on a personal note, I came to Florida for its natural environment, its beauty, and its wildlife, not for endless concrete and urban sprawl. The self-interest plan special interest plan, I'm sorry, will be a disaster for the state. We must protect what little is left, what cannot be replaced. No build is the only option. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shabbat. Next up is Ingrid Ramirez from Valerico, Florida. Next up is Allison Date from Tampa, Florida. Allison, you are unmuted. Hi, um, I'm Allison, Tampa, and I'd like to believe that it's possible to find something positive in a challenging experience. So I'm grateful that COVID-19 has allowed many of us the opportunity to be present at these meetings that in the past would be difficult to attend. This pandemic is also a wake-up call that highlights our need to protect biodiversity and limit unsustainable growth and development, such as the turnpike system being discussed today. This project is based on an outdated, unsustainable belief system that ignores scientific research, which exposes the damage it will cause. The creation of this road system will destroy some of the last wildlife areas left in the central quarters of Florida. Just saying that makes me sad. This project is not life enhancing. COVID-19 has reinforced our awareness of the undeniable truth that all life forms on this planet are interconnected. So it's truly ironic how research shows a significant relationship between the loss of biodiversity to an increase of infectious diseases in humans. And one of the reasons we're in this situation is because we have not protected our planet's ecosystems adequately. As we continue to grow our population and degrade our environment through unsustainable development, like the road system suggested here today, the earth is losing species as an, at an alarming rate. In the last 40 years, almost 60% of planetary biodiversity has been lost. The threats on Earth are far more today than 50 years ago. And so we need to change our way of life now. So the challenge we have is how can we meet the food needs, the water needs, and the energy needs in a way that doesn't destroy biodiversity and nature? We cannot afford to do business as usual. 
Let COVID-19 alert you to the need to reject this plan and instead use the same money to support life by improving and rebuilding our existing infrastructures, developing mass transit options, creating communities that leave, protecting our agriculture and protecting communities that leave what is left of our, and leave what is left of our developing, undeveloped landscape untouched. Creating these roads will only lead to ruin and the nature that is lost can never be fully replaced. Now, in this time of all of us being exposed to an invisible enemy of our own making, we must stop and rethink our present course of promoting destruction of biodiversity and act in a way. Time's up, Miss Date. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Dalton Dees from Cedar Key, Florida. Next up is Paula Purvis from Florida. Next up is Donna White from Lakeland, Florida. Next up is Marion Bazif from Tallahassee, Florida. Next up is Karen Hollington, sorry, Karen Holland from Wellington, Florida. Karen, you are unmuted. Karen Holland, you are self-muted if you would like to unmute to comment. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Oh, yay. Hi, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, I am listening very carefully to what has been presented at the beginning, and I am in agreement with a lot of people who are feeling the pain, emotional pain, and uh, the, the seclusion and isolation, and the feeling that caged animals must feel, and therefore, if we build the roads through the corridors, um, it would be more or less like caging those animals. And it, I think it's just important to get in touch with those feelings and, um, I don't know, acknowledging them. I, I, I'm going off on a tangent, but I, I really think that it's more important for us to spend the money on something that can help people at this moment. Granted that Governor DeSantis had passed this bill two years ago, um, but things change. And I think that the government, our government, government by the people, need to change with what's happening at the moment and be able to say, you know what, maybe this isn't the right time to go forward with this project. Let's put the brakes on it a little bit so that we can help the people who really need the help right now. I understand the road will help uh, truckers, and we need truckers right now to deliver the goods and what have you. But um, I do believe that this is more destructive. I I'm listening to the birds outside. I haven't heard them in so long, and I, I see all the videos on Facebook about the animals coming back to those different areas, and it's really beautiful. And we need those spaces and we need to know that those spaces are there, even if we don't get the opportunity to visit them every single day or not even every week. But we know that they're there and it just does us so good. I think that's what God intended for us all. I don't want to offend anybody uh, by mentioning the higher power or a uh, great spirit, but I do believe that that's important that we all have that that sensibility and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak my mind and my heart thank you miss holland next up is joe borninier from bonita, bonita springs florida
Next up is Christopher Posey from Fort Myers, Florida. Next up is Haley Underwood from Fort Myers, Florida. Next up is Herman Younger from Gainesville, Florida. Herman, you are unmuted. Yes, could you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Herman Younger, organizing representative uh, for the Sierra Club based in Gainesville, Florida. To ensure that the basic needs of Floridians are met during and after the COVID-19 pandemic will require an unprecedented fiscal response at a time when our state's primary revenue sources may be severely diminished. A recent analysis by 1,000 Friends of Florida found that the total cost of the disastrous proposed MCORS toll roads could be more than $21 billion. How reckless and shameful of our state to continue to put the needs of private interests and polluters over the needs of the elderly, the immunocompromised, the frontline healthcare workers, and the working class. Enough is enough. Our taxpayer dollars must be used to fund our fight against COVID-19. We the people will bear the brunt of your reckless decisions if you continue to fund this useless toll road project. Floridians' lives are in your hands. Defund MCORs now and recommend no build. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Younger. Next up is Carrie Cringeter from Jeffersonville, Indiana. Next up is Wanda Kloof from Naples, Florida. Wanda, you are unmuted. Wanda Kloof from Naples, Florida, you are unmuted. Last call and we'll circle back. Wanda Clute from Naples, Florida. Moving on, next up, Mandy Dickman from Miami, Florida. Mandy, you are unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning to the task force. And um, I, uh, my name is Mindy Dickman. I, I live in Miami. I'm author of the book, Life in the Greater Everglades, a young explorer's manual and field guide. Um, I'm in shock that this has gone through, that this was passed two years ago. Um, I'm angry, I'm sad. There's a lot of emotion. I'm, I'm a mother, um, I'm a naturalist and it just still amazes me that so many people don't realize exactly how nature works and where we've come from. Back in the 70s, the Chesapeake Bay was a cesspool and we passed the Clean Water Act, which the Trump administration just tried to tear apart. And thank God the Supreme Court this week voted against tearing it apart. So our waters will be protected under that bill. We also had bald eagles and pelicans and so many animals that were going extinct and so the Endangered Species Act was passed in the 70s as well. And you would think people would remember those times and that we've learned our lesson. Um, so um, obviously I don't believe that this highway should be built. There won't be any Floridians to drive on it because at that point, the state will be completely ruined. This is the last little bit that the remains this wildlife corridor, it's crucial for panthers to be connected from down south up to the north. Disease, the panthers have a new disease um, because they're not genetically diversified, because they cannot migrate. Uh, already this year, 10 panthers have been killed by vehicles in Collier County um, because they have nowhere to go. And um, nature doesn't work in little disconnected pieces. We have to combine these lands and keep them protected for the animals. Also for public health, the saltwater intrusion is only slowed by wetlands being allowed to flow down to the aquifers. Um, we've seen algae blooms 
because the water is dirty and uh, there's not enough water. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers right now is, is uh, working on plans for Lake Okeechobee, trying to distribute water. They're distributing dirty water. We have a lot of issues that we're dealing with with the state that have not been uh, resolved yet. And then, of course, COVID. And just there is such a long list of reasons why you please need to find an alternative to this. I do believe everybody can win. And uh, it's the task force responsibility to please find that solution that is going to work for everyone, especially for, for wild Florida. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is David Hastings from St. Petersburg, Florida. David, you are unmuted. Hello, this is David Hastings. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Excellent. Hi. So uh, I'm David Hastings. I live in Gainesville, Florida. I'm a retired professor of marine science and chemistry. I'm an aquatic chemist and I've lived in Florida for 20 years. I really appreciate the opportunity to articulate my concerns about building the proposed northern turnpike connector. I moved here to Florida about 20 years ago thinking I was moving to a very urban state like the one I knew from a short visit to Miami. Instead, I discovered a wealth of unparalleled outdoor opportunities with spectacular clear-fed spring red rivers, long river runs, and wonderful hikes. These areas kept me here in the Sunshine State. But these pristine areas are not just good for recreation. They're also essential to replenishing the Floridan aquifer, which supplies our cities with clean drinking water and water to irrigate farms. <clears throat> While we don't realize that these expanses of natural lands protect Florida's water as rainwater percolates through the limestone rock. Development of these lands to build the roads limits their ability to absorb rainwater with the water supply being threatened and water quality in crisis around the state. We must, we must take great care of these natural areas. We should not destroy the waters that are so essential to the future of our state. Building these roads will not only impact our water supply and our water quality, it's a bad business decision. There is no good data that establishes a true need for these toll roads. I recognize that there may be a legitimate concern with how the main, the main artery for transportation, Interstate 75, can, can accommodate future traffic flow and possible emergency evacuation. While building new toll roads may appear to be the best solution, this proposal was rushed through the Florida House with very little discussion or debate. I strongly oppose the building of these new toll roads. There are far better alternatives that we should explore that are better for our economy, better for our environment, and better for our rural communities. I thank you for your attention and for the opportunities to articulate my concerns about this important issue. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Hastings. Up next is Angela Coop from Cocoa, Florida. Next up is Francis Higgins from Melbourne, Florida. Next up is Suzanne House from Tampa, Florida. Next up is Christian Wagley from Pensacola, Florida. Christian, you are unmuted. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, yeah, again, Christian Wagley. I work with uh, Healthy Gulf, and we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to the Gulf of Mexico and the waterways and the communities along its shores. Um, we engage with thousands of members and supporters in all five Gulf states and along the Florida Gulf Coast from Pensacola, which is where I live, all the way down to the Everglades. We strongly believe that the only viable recommendation for this task force is no build. The environmental damages from crossing streams and rivers, filling wetlands, and facilitating sprawl into rural areas of our state will have tremendously negative impacts on the health of our rivers, bays, and the Gulf of Mexico. 
Uh, specifically, the coastal areas downstream of the toll road corridor are some of the highest quality and most pristine systems in the state, and they depend on clean, fresh water flowing from inland areas. Uh, while we appreciate the task force's work to consider these impacts, uh, those impacts cannot be avoided altogether. Uh, if built, this road will cause tremendous damage to the waterways that are so important to the economy, lifestyle, and culture of communities in this region. Uh, you know, as we ponder these toll roads, I can't help but think of the parallels to a transportation project located just seven miles east of where I sit at home this morning. It's the Garcon Point Bridge, which is nicknamed Bo Bo's Bridge. Um, it was then pushed by then Florida House Speaker Bo Johnson, who owned land on the northern side of the bridge. Um, the traffic studies used to justify the bridge's construction vastly overstated the traffic the bridge would see in the largely rural area. Uh, which the traffic consultants later admitted. And today the bridge looks more like the roadway equivalent of a ghost town. Um, 20 years later, uh, after construction, there's a lawsuit between bondholders and the FDOT over FDOT's failure to raise tolls as requested. And the bridge is still $100 million in debt. All of this because the bridge promoters first decided they wanted a bridge, then they tried to create a process that would justify it. These proposed toll roads are following that same scenario. Uh, but as task force members, you all have been given the power to put a check on that and to restore integrity to transportation planning in Florida. Considering the fact that these roads have little support in the communities they would cross and the environmental damages that they would cause, Healthy Gulf asks you to present no build as the only viable option. We will continue to actively engage our members and supporters around this issue through the remainder of, of this process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagley. Next up is Mabel Patterson from Riverview, Florida. Mabel, you are unmuted. Thank you. I'm Mabel Patterson from Riverview, Florida, and I'm here, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the staff and the facilitators for helping me work through some technical issues and getting on. I disagree with the commenter who complained and there are, there's room for improvement, especially in the comment section, but I think you're doing a good job. However, I think that the resources that the state is putting towards these task forces would be better used, especially in this uh, time of crisis in helping out the Office of Economic Opportunity, where millions of Floridians are trying to get help and largely not succeeding. I also think that the FDOT could be better working at this time trying to repair our broken supply chain so that farmers can get their goods to market. In the same way, I think that these toll roads are a terrible misuse of our public funds. Uh, I've heard a lot of commenters say that they're not impacted by them or they don't live in a county affected by them. I don't either, but I am a Florida taxpayer and my money will have to support these unneeded roads. Uh, I will have to suffer with the unmet needs that my tax dollars could have been addressing. I, in my opinion, the toll roads are highway robbery, literally. You are using a highway to rob the people of Florida and put that money into the bank accounts of a few large corporations, construction firms, developers, maybe some legislators. I think that it's time to either push this to the back burner or just throw it out the door altogether. Uh, these roads should not be built. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Patterson. Next up is Keeley Sayers from Florida. Next up is A. Walcott from Hollywood, Florida. Next up is Susan Steinhauser from Coconut Creek, Florida. Susan, you are unmuted. Hey, good. Well, yep, still good morning, not good afternoon yet. Um, I am from Coconut Creek, like you said, and I would like to thank you guys for holding this webinar and a particular thank you to Tommy Ball and Brandy Bertram for confirming I'd be able to speak. I was supposed to speak yesterday, but somehow that didn't work out. 
Um, I do hope that you guys will provide remote access for meetings six through nine um, if they are held in person. And I appreciate being able to attend this meeting without taking a day off from work and traveling a great distance. Uh, although I do live a distance from where these roads would be built, similar to other folks who have been on this call, I have a number of concerns. Uh, some of these I've had since Senate Bill 7068 was rushed through the 2019 legislature. And some of these concerns are new since facing the coronavirus. Others have already expressed environmental concerns, and I would just like to echo those quickly. Concerns about pollution, degradation of water quality, destruction of wildlife habitat. And thank you specifically to Adrian Barman, who on today's call, and also a gentleman yesterday's call about Southwest Corridor, highlighted climate change and pointed out that paving over green spaces does the opposite of what we need to do to cool the earth. If you think COVID-19 has disrupted our lifestyle, Hold on to your hats because you have not seen anything yet. Our children and our grandchildren are going to need to deal with things that are far worse than anything we've seen to date. From day one, we've said that the dollars allocated for the MCORS project would be better spent on education, health care, and current infrastructure repair. Anybody who lives in Fort Lauderdale knows what it's like to have poop in your streets. Now that we're facing COVID-19, this reallocation is critical. If we want to open our state safely, we need testing. We need to know who's been exposed to COVID-19, who has antigens and antibodies, who is ready to go back to work safely. For food security, we need to develop better supply chains. We need to make sure that food can get from the farm to the store to the people who are in need. And as far as education goes, how many kids have been left behind now because they're not able to learn from home, whether they don't have broadband access or perhaps their parents are out on the front lines trying to save lives and there's nobody to help these kids learn from home. Now is not the time to build roads. I'm asking that you please move forward with a no build recommendation and kudos to Kat Holland who spoke about now not being the time. Um, I agree with her 100%. So thank you very much. And if I do have any additional time, I would love for somebody to let me know what building roads has to do with installing broadband and why on earth anybody in our government is telling Floridians that these roads will help with hurricane evacuation when we're supposed to shelter in place, either in our homes if they're safe or in a local shelter. Thank you. Thank Ms. you. Stavshauser. Next up is Susan. Caruso from Wilton Manors, Florida. Susan, Caruso, you are unmuted. You are self-muted if you'd like to unmute on your end. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, um, I am Susan Caruso. I'm from Broward County. However, as a taxpayer, I think that gives me the right to make comments. However, we also have a cabin up in the Suwannee River Valley that we love because of the peace and quiet and the way of life up there. That will be forever impacted by this um, toll road project. But I also want to point out the irony. <laughs> With COVID-19, now that you're switching to a communication method, you supposedly want to hear from the public and the people impacted most, one of the goals of this project is to increase connectivity. People don't have it. So how you expect the most impacted people to communicate what they want during this time is uh, ironic to say the least. So on that basis alone, this process should be at least suspended until you can do the face-to-face -face and people who are impacted and don't have connectivity can come and tell you face to face. The second thing I think is ironic is that you are willing, our legislators are willing to spend money on land for these roads, but they are not willing to spend money to purchase land for forever Florida, which the people 
voted for through direct democracy. They told our legislators, buy land, spend this money on land. But no, we're not gonna purchase it for Forever Florida. We're gonna purchase, purchase it for toll roads. That for all the reasons that have been stated, it's just a horrible, horrible idea. And I think part of our problem is that we're confusing, well, our legislators seem to be confusing money with wealth and progress with development. Our wealth is our natural resources, it's our species, it's our farmland, it's our culture, it's all the things that we are trying to sacrifice that this poor task force is saying, okay, well, we can give up that, we can give up that, there's no need for that. And progress should be spending money directly on connectivity, on education. And the question was asked, how many kids are taken out of poverty per mile? I haven't heard an answer for that. These toll roads are just the worst idea and an obvious ploy to get developers more money. So please suspend this process now. And I wanna know how much more money we're gonna use before we even decide whether or not this is economically feasible. So please, no build, stop this madness. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crusoe. Next up is Jake Zydek from Tampa, Florida. Jake, you are unmuted. Thank you, yes, this is Jake Zydek. I'm an environmental scientist and ecology uh, PhD candidate at USF. Um, I'm here to speak at, speak out against this uh, proposed MCORS you know, toll road thing. Um, it's kind of a question. I don't know who all on the uh, task force is still online, but um, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, if they're being held hostage by the uh, construction firms and stuff, they all sounded like good people who work for the state, who are supposed to be servants of the citizens. Um, but they're, uh, I don't know, I mean, I don't know what their personal opinions are, but uh, here's DOT doing this big um, PR stunt to try to sell us this um, toll road going right through the middle of the state. Um, we know roads don't solve any traffic issues, so it's kind of already dead in the water on that. I don't really get this uh, kind of Trojan horse proposition of the, um, the broadband and all these other facilities that are supposed to come as a byproduct of that. It's kind of a little shaky. Um, and yeah, I'm just curious. It seems like DOT is putting a lot of effort into um, PR instead of uh, you know improving transportation. And this project won't improve transportation. Um, yeah, this, this, the kind of, uh, I don't know what, um, model of economics they're going by, but I don't think people want more Starbucks's and Walmarts. Um, sounds like that's what they're doing. I don't think rural people want a big, uh, road paved through their backyard or through their ranch or whatever lands they're on or Starbucks and Walmart. Um, and that also just sucks resources out of the state. Uh, yeah, Bill Galvano he has a get rich scheme and some developers will uh, make some quick money and maybe even the state will get some fees money from fee money from all this construction. But um, the state will be footing the bill for all that infrastructure that goes into these um, strip malls that are just going to be uh, defunct in a few months. So, um, yeah, it's kind of uh, kind of insulting and um, yeah, no offense, but like just layering GIS maps isn't really science. Um, so, I mean, it's been like almost a year and we just see maps. I don't, I don't get that. It seems kind of uh, um, just kind of pieced together um, without much analysis really. Uh, so yeah, no build, that's all. Thank you, next up is Nico Winders from Tallahassee, Florida. Next up is Jeffrey Shapiro from Gainesville, Florida. Jeffrey, you are unmuted. You are self-muted.
Mr. Shapiro, if you'll unmute on your end so that you can talk. Mr. Shapiro, you are self-muted on your end. If you will unmute, if not, we will circle back. All right, Mr. Shapiro, we will circle back. Next up is Diana Umpire from Pembroke Prime. Diana, you are unmuted. Diana Empire from Pembroke Primes, you are unmuted. Speaking. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm glad that just happened because um, that's the first thing that I want to point out about this process. Um, I can help to, you know, I want to be polite to you all because I know how hard you all work to put this together. But on the other hand, I've just got to tell you that as a, as a member of the public, um, this is just not working out. Um, so I, I know, for instance, that some of the people that you call, um, there were people that were on landlines. And they're not able to get in um, into the call because they are not able to get an audio pin. Um, so this, you know, while webinars, you know, do have some some kind of benefit to get those of us that cannot travel, it certainly is not the kind of public participation that we need. So um, please rethink this, and um, let's just make sure that uh, that we have a real public process in place that in, that also includes in-person meetings. Um, Next thing I just, you know, I'm going to make some comments, um, you know, as somebody who is involved in, um, in NISCA advocacy, um, part of, you know, have this uh, organization called the Night Sky Conservancy, which is an affiliate of the International Dark Sky Association. And one of the things that I asked um, yesterday in the other meeting, and I'm going, I'm going to continue to ask, is that you add on the GIS layers that are evaluated, that you add one that includes um, information about the light pollution that we have um, in Florida, because the task force members need to know um, the amazing impact that these roads will have in the last remaining uh, natural areas that we have in Florida. Um, these natural dark areas are important for a lot of um, wildlife, uh, fireflies, bats, heck, even pollinators um, and plants that feed us. Um, and I'm sorry, FDOT has a pretty lousy record um, of doing some really horrible projects. And that's not even in addition to all the sprawl that will bring um, all those problems. Um, the next thing I want to raise is, uh, you know, as was mentioned, agricultural lands. You know, where I live here in Broward, um, when I moved here 20 years ago, we still had agricultural lands. All of that is gone. We have incredible amount of roads and we're always still in traffic. So in other words, boats are not going to alleviate traffic. That's really, I mean, it's just a, a paradigm that it just won't fix itself. Um, and, uh, and again, I really want to encourage, you know, in this time that we're in, we should be spending our public dollars to support um, programs like the Rural and Family Lands Protection Program to protect our agricultural lands, um, as well as the Florida Forever programs um, to help tackle pollution soil regeneration, um, which is so important for um, capturing our carbon in, um, and dealing with, you know, the potential keep on loses of soil, protection of our wetlands and our watersheds. Um, so again, I really ask you all to Thank go you, on this. Diana. Thank you. Your time is up. Next up, Bob Krawski from Borrego Springs, California. Bob, you are unmuted. Bob Krasowski, you are unmuted.
Last call for Bob Krasowski. You are unmuted. If not, we will circle back. Moving on, Kay Gates from Boynton Beach, Florida. Next up is Gail Koslag from Denellen, Florida. Next up is Don Harworth from Monticello, Florida. Next up, Scott Hutter from Tallahassee, Florida. Next up is Miha Frida from Miami, Florida. You are unmuted. You are self-muted if you want to unmute on your end. All right. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, hi, my name is Mihai Preda. I'm calling from Pine Crest in Miami. And I'm a teacher. I'm working with the Fridays for Future students uh, here in Miami who are petitioning their local governments to to declare a climate emergency and to act on it. And uh, I would like to, to speak uh, against this uh, project in uh, about the toll roads, because uh, these new toll roads will come with, uh, they are a major emitter of new greenhouse gases. It, they're gonna lead to increased emissions and uh, they come with all the other infrastructure, with new power plants. We have heard the task force members uh, speak about this. So, if we have, if we want to have any any chance of stabilizing the climate, the first thing we need to do is stop building new fossil fuel infrastructure. And uh, these uh, toll roads are a prime example. So uh, I would urge everybody on the task force and um, everybody who is listening and so on um, to, to, or anybody who has uh, any, any decision power, any say in this process uh, to think about it like this. This is a binary choice to build or not to build. Building these roads essentially eliminate our chance to a stable climate and the future. And um, so, so that, that essentially means this is a choice about giving our children a future and not giving them a uh, our children a future. That's all there is. Okay, thank you very much for holding this meeting and for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mike Ewald from Coral Gables, Florida. Next up is Maxine Connor from Homosassa, Florida. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Maxine Connor, Homosassa, Florida, uh, co chair of the Solar and Clean Transportation Committee of League of Women Voters of Florida, and conservation chair of Sierra Adventure Coast Group. Um, I am speaking for myself, uh, informed by the positions of those two organizations. Uh, League of Women Voters of Florida and Sierra Club are part of a coalition of 90 conservation organizations, civic groups, and businesses from all across Florida that are opposed to the MCORS toll roads as stated in their May 1st letter to Governor DeSantis urging him to vote, uh, to veto rather, uh, SB 7068, the toll roads bill. Um, a task force member today asked, 
if Springs Protection Zones in Levy County, which he stated were part of the comp plan, were added to the maps. My question is, did you add all the Springs priority focus areas to the maps? That's very important to the maps and layers because we have more first magnitude springs than anywhere in the world and we need to protect all of our springs. Um, did you put the entire wildlife corridor on the maps and layers? Um, COVID-19 has changed everything. It is sad that it's a law with the timeline and deadlines during this pandemic, which is a public health emergency. And now um, it seems to be an inappropriate time for this process and it's not in the task force task force uh, control. Um, the dollars uh, or funds from tolls may not even be available to pay for the toll roads because COVID-19 changed everything and I don't think things are going to be the same for a long time. I agree with the previous speaker about assuming that 900 to 1,000 people will come to Florida per day. Uh, it's a growth estimate that now is going to be changed by COVID-19. We don't really know what that's going to be. So that's an unknown assumption. And it's an unknown assumption that the tolls will pay for the road. Um, as a member of the public, I would like to see statistics showing that these toll roads are necessary and the pandemic will continually change that information even. So task, uh, uh, will all of the task force members get and read all of the public comments is one of my concerns. Um, this shows no plans for climate resiliency and to stop the climate change. Road building removes forest and that absorbs heat. That, that forest is a carbon sink in our natural areas and uh, they absorb carbon dioxide. Uh, then uh, the roads will lay out asphalt, which holds heat and warms the climate, making and more vehicles with uh, CO2 emissions and other emissions that pollute and hold heat continue the uh, warming and that continues sea level rise. And we have over 8,000 miles of coastline in Florida. So we are very vulnerable. We have king tides and flooding. And uh, as a former person mentioned, um, we have uh, pollution coming in from, from um, sewers that get flooded. So we want clean transportation, carbon free living that will be sustainable and preserve our land and our wildlife habitat and our springs. We need to Thank you, Ms. Connor. Next up is Deborah Schuer from Gainesville, Florida. Next up is Kate McFall from Tallahassee, Florida. Kate, it appears you've called in without a pin. If you would like to hang up and redial and use your audio pin, we're going to circle back around. Okay, circling back around, the first three are going to be Kim Wheeler, Sarah Mace, and Debbie Colt. Kim Wheeler, you are unmuted. Levy County, I'm in Williston. I back up to uh, the Bailey Tract of the Gopher Forest, where we have gopher tortoises are cockaded woodpeckers and I have coming down into my yard uh, eastern indigos. It's a wonderful place to live and I feel very lucky as an older American who's facing problems with COVID-19 with family members who have health issues. So I'm very thankful for this rural area. I also want to thank our county commissioners for passing a no-build resolution. And right now I'm speaking for myself, but I'm also representing the Levy County citizens who oppose the toll roads for the following reasons. Number one, finances. Given the current state of uncertainty with the financial impact of the coronavirus, we believe that the MCORS process is throwing our hard-earned tax monies on roads that are not needed. Our CFO, Jimmy Petronas, wrote regarding COVID-19, we are at war in many ways with an unseen enemy and a time of war is a time of uncertainty. Our job is to be as conscientious as possible when spending Florida taxpayer money. Well, right now this process, we won't go there. 
agriculture. With the current pandemic, we need to be protecting our agricultural lands, not paving over them. Environmental and quality of life is the other reason the toll roads would damage our farms, our ranches, wetlands, forests, and most importantly, our aquifer. These roads would irrevocably alter our rural communities and our way of life. Climate change, oh my God. Excuse me, I shouldn't have said it like that, but I'm very concerned. Climate change and sea level rise will require another challenge, requiring funds as evidenced by the creation of the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. Not sure what they're doing so far, but we already have saltwater intrusion in Levy County. We're concerned. And most importantly, the process, where's the data? The MCORS process is costly and it lacks data. It is not a normal FDOT process, which I have a great deal of respect for. Um, if this were an FDOT process and rather one that was uh, legislated, I would have different feelings possibly. I wouldn't want the toll roads, but I would be more accepting of the process. The timeline requiring completion 2030 is unrealistic, and we believe our governor and our representatives should repeal the M legislation. Please do not pave over the Florida we love. I and so many others are saying no build. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wheeler. Up next is Sarah Mapes. Next up is Debbie Culp. Debbie Culp, you are unmuted. You are also self-muted. If you'd like to unmute on your end so you can speak. Debbie Culp, you are unmuted. If you'd like to unmute on your end so that you can speak. Last call for Debbie Culp. Moving on, Wanda Culp from Naples, Florida. Wanda, you are unmuted. Thank you and hello. I reside in Naples, Florida. Nearly every waterway here and throughout Florida is impaired. It is polluted by agriculture, human waste, phosphate products, and bacteria from algae. We currently use 650 million gallons of water per day. We have 760 million gallons available per day. We also have a serious saltwater intrusion problem to consider. The funds for the toll road to East Coast, the West Coast, would be better spent upgrading our sewage and water infrastructure in order to continue to meet our current demands. We are swimming in sewage, toxic chemicals, and deadly bacteria. We need to improve our present living conditions. Our pre to meet the increasing demands on our beautiful state and nature, we need never forget nature's deadly summer of 2018. We are now the endangered humans of 2020. Thank you for your conscious attention to all occupants' livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Jeff Shapiro. You are unmuted, Jeff Shapiro. Can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Finally, it's been a struggle. Your technology is not working for most people, I see. Um, I, I maintain that the cost to benefit ratio is extremely high and that the FDOT has done no analysis of this ratio. It's really important for FDOT to begin to explore the cost to benefit ratio of these roadways. And it has to be done from another number of points of view, not from the single point of view of the builders and developers. I agree with all the people who have spoken so far that this should not go forward. Um, I'm with the League of Women Voters. I also participate with the NAACP and with the Sierra Club. Um, I think that the, um, especially in the time of COVID, as you've heard, this is not feasible at all. It should be put off for at least a year, maybe two, or maybe forever. I, I really don't like the idea of the project. I think there's much more that can be done that would be much better in keeping with our economic situation, as well as with our need for a good environment. Uh, I'm especially concerned about the environment, being a, a retired scientist, and I see that, that the environmental cost would be quite high, especially with regard to water. Water must flow to the coast from the interior and from the north, and this can impact that flow. It's really important. Uh, we need to consider our water, and we can see the results of not considering it with regard to Lake Oka Okeechobee runoff being pumped out to both coasts and, and having incredible impacts on those coasts and on tourism. Uh, the, the economic cost of this project would be extremely high beyond what COVID has, has already unleashed on us, and it, it really is unfeasible at this point. I also think that you need to look at the hurricane impacts. Uh, Houston is a really good example. If you build in the wrong places and you build in the wrong ways, then you simply get catastrophic damage. Houston will never recover from it. I therefore urge you not to take it out on the manatees at Crystal River, not to take it out on the other animals like the panthers and the bears, but instead to consider the critical importance of our water and the value of that water and the other environmental values as well. Pay attention, pay attention to your, your populace. Thank you very much. I appreciate it and I hope FDOT does well for us, the voters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shapiro. Up next is Bob Krasowski from Borrego Springs, California. Bob, you are unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Oh, well, I'll just, uh, I was a former resident of Florida, I might come back, but uh, I'm out here in California and it's very disturbing to see the track that we're all following uh, in, in continuing the behaviors that uh, humanity has uh, taken uh, in our planet, on our planet, and, and nationally and internationally. And I would uh, just uh, like to agree with so many of the speakers that this uh, project should be at least put it on hold and that um, the resources and attention and the talents of all the people involved be redirected. And then we can come back to uh, transportation and Florida development at a later date. And uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Krakowski. Up next is Kate McFall from Tallahassee, Florida. Kate McFall from Tallahassee, Florida.
Kate McFall from Tallahassee, Florida. Last call. Okay, this concludes our webinar. Thank you for your time.